if we have been telling people for 20 years to not leave their machines unlocked for 10 seconds while they go to the toilet or uh, to not do these things with passwords and to, uh, you know, we've, if we keep telling them the same thing, I mean, I'm getting so bored of it. They must be going nuts. They, oh, they, they probably aren't. They probably are like this. We're not listening. You weird security people. You think that like Russia or China or, you know, uh, North Korea are going to come after me, but actually I'm, I'm Joe Smith from Hull, and all I want to do is go to the chippy and buy a bag of chips with my iPhone. Like, I think we've got a huge communication problem, and I might be wrong about that, but the stuff we talk about is not new, it's not novel. Um, the risk landscape has changed hugely. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Denied podcast. I'm your host for the episode, Joe Carson. Pleasure to be here. Really excited. And we're always bringing really interesting, amazing, talented people um, who really are you know, doing loads to make the world a safer place. Um, so I'm joined with an awesome guest today. We have met quite a few years ago, interestingly, in a bar. Um, but I'm joined by Dan. So Dan, uh, over to you to give us a little bit of background about yourself, what you do, uh, what things you get up to, and you know, you know, what things you do to make the world a safer place. Cool. Hey, thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm Dan. If you don't already know me, I am a consultant. I uh, specialize in helping organizations improve their security postures and better enable them businesses through technology. Right. Nice and simple on that one. <laughs> nice and simple. Right. Any, any, any interesting fun things about yourself? Any any things? That, I mean, you know, well, what, I what I also do is. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do a lot of tweets, and uh, I mean, I'm a professional tweeter. I think the uh, the expression is, but the I think you got an award for a professional tweeter, wasn't it? <laughs> Most entered. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, I do a lot of a, uh, I do a lot of stuff, right? So uh, I do lots of community work. I do lots of like threat intelligence. I uh, do weird, mad honey pots and. Sp- Spend loads of money on friends at Microsoft, keep them employed. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I look at how we can like better like enable ourselves to defend uh, against like digital threats that we face in in ways that I don't think that I think people think we do already, but that actually aren't quite done in the same way. So I try and help people and share what I know or my learning experiences because I don't know that much. So I try and share online what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, as best as possible, because what I do is very odd. Everyone always asks me, what do you do? And I'm like, I do cyber <laughs> stuff. Um, but I try and take what, I'd, what I've what i learned from the last 20-odd mm-hmm. years uh, in industry and what I do from a research and from a fun point of view. Uh, I'm really lucky in the sense that uh, I've got a job that's my hobby. So basically, Likewise, I, get, which, I mean, which is which, I, which is our, our good thing and also can be our evil as well. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't, it's, I said some, um, someone earlier, I said that like, mm-hmm. uh, my, my business is, is very odd, it's niche. Um, mm-hmm. I set up a microservices company, so it's a similar model to large companies. It's just that yep. it's me and a load of robots in a server room. <laughs> uh, software and, and a, a, someone said it's like an intelligence network but me and my mates um, <laughs> as I call it and uh, you know d- doing stuff to try and help people so like looking at how we how we can look at countries to see if we can make them safer how how do we help uh, protect hospitals how do we help mm-hmm. protect critical services uh, and how do we do weird and wonderful things that um may or may not work, right? Because you, you never get uh, innovation or improvement by doing what someone else has done. Uh, you need to be looking into things and spaces and ideas um, that are new, novel, and, and often fail. So you end up spending lots of time doing <laughs> weird and stuff you, and going, oh, that doesn't you, work. You are, you are a real-life James Bond, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd tell everyone I'd have to kill them, right? The, um, it is funny, like... Uh, I think that's a great, like, the James Bond thing's funny. I obviously am a massive James Bond fan. Um, Absolutely. You know, that's not exactly... I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't tell that at all. I couldn't, I couldn't. <laughs> also, because, like, I, look, real life and, and films are completely different, aren't they? So if we sat there and I'm like, oh, what am I doing today? I do a lot of work on my own. Um, mm-hmm. I might be working with people, but I'm like, I work with myself. So um, <laughs> I tend to find that if I'm going to share content or stories or... Do things like that are 
interesting, it's a lot better to make them more interesting than they than they are, right? If I said to someone, yeah. oh, what we're going to go and do today is we're going to dump a million logs and we're going to sit there and stare through spreadsheets <laughs> and, and not know what we're doing because we don't know what we're looking at until we looked at it um, and we might find something, oh. then it doesn't sound so as fun, does it? So. I think the, if, if if people really knew, I, I always love the picture about the you know the the, the memes that shows you what what you know your parents think you do, what your friends think you do, what what reality you do. And I'm I mean I've spent I can't tell you how much of my life I've spent looking at log files, and and just mundane having two screens side by side, <laughs> and just comparing numbers and looking for lost data, looking for duplication of something. You know, sitting and looking for basically you know hashes and UIDs and GUIDs. I, or a type of tons- bloody username, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, but the thing is, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's great, you know, fast forward to today, there's a lot of automation that can do things, you know, much faster, you know, you know than maybe 10, 15 years ago when you had to do a lot of it manually. Um, you bring up one, one thing I just want to go back on to. You mentioned a bit about hospitals and, and making the world. Um, can you talk a little bit about CV19? Because I think that was important. Uh, yourself and Lisa um, kind of uh, introduced the CV19. It was back at the start of COVID. If you can give the audience a little bit of a background of what CB19 was, why it started, and what what the motives and intentions was. Yeah, so, um, right, to to go back in sort of my thought process. uh, When the pandemic started, I I sat there and I was like, oh, this could be quite bad. People might be like, why was it? Obviously, it's bad. It's not, you know, but from a digital point of view, from a cybersecurity perspective. So in 2017, I responded to WannaCry. inside the trust and i've done quite a bit of work for the nhs and i've traveled over hundreds of businesses over the last 20 odd years mm-hmm. so i've got some idea and i've done this to huge and small orgs and um, i've got some idea about what the world looks like probably at least i hope i have uh, some people may think i'm mad but you know um <laughs> <laughs> so I sat there and I was like, oh, what happens if I ransomware? I don't mean me, but like if a hospital gets ransomware during a pandemic when there's no beds or, or all these other kinds of problems. And it was a real moment of uncertainty, I think, in the world. I think all of us felt like, crap, what's what's happening? Like, this is not, we're not allowed to leave our houses. This is like a bloody film. This is like being in contagion. Um, and so I sat there and uh, it was me, Lisa and Rad online. I, I'm not even going to get like trying to remember the exact route, but I basically was just like, oh, we should get some bags together and put some laptops aside and get ready to go in if we need to, right? Yeah. Because that's literally what happened in WannaCry, right? I I, mm-hmm. I, I got a phone call and I ended up in a hospital. It wasn't like a, uh, I wasn't sitting there waiting for it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we did that and then suddenly there was loads of interest like and we had this conversation online in public i think or part of it in public yeah and it went from that concept of we should prepare because we didn't think that you know our guess was do people have people really prepared for this kind of event i mean mm-hmm. it's like a zombie film isn't it so i would say it no it was indeed it was uh, some i mean me being based in Estonia, it was a little bit different from the rest of the world. Yes, we had, you know, of course, the, the same restrictions as everybody else. But here, we tend to do a lot of things online digitally anyway. And two meters is sometimes, for Estonians, is a little bit closer than they actually prefer to be anyway. <laughs> so so we're here, you know, they, they actually were glad when the restrictions lifted because then they could go back to the normal distances of like 10 meters apart. Um, but here everything was done digitally. So, you know, even schools and, you know, healthcare, a lot of the things were, were done digitally. But it really highlighted a lot of the things, I think, around supply chains was probably the biggest issue here of getting things, you know, the supply chain uh, interruption and getting, you know, goods and getting food and energy and all those things. There started to be the big realization of how dependent you are um, on supply chain. Um, but I think, you know, even the UK, I think, you know, some, had similar challenges as well, um, getting stock of even medicines and um, yeah, getting, yeah. getting and people, you know, maintenance and stuff as well. So so this was the kind of thought process in my head, right? I was like, oh, okay. And, and plus, it sounds stupid, but like, I think I wasn't on a project at the time. So I was sitting there going, oh, I haven't got a, like, I was like, I'm, I can't really go out to a sales lunch anymore. Um, but the, but yeah, so we sat there and we're like, okay, what should we do? And then it's like, it got a lot of interest. It was in Forbes, Wired, and we had thousands yep. of people watching yep. it. 
and that creates its own challenge in itself. But so essentially, like my my initial view was like prepped for instant response support, get people that are mm -hmm. vetted professionals, as in my friends, right? Without yep. being silly about it, get some of my friends together and get some. You know, I was like, cool, like we can get the kit ordered if we need to. We've probably already got all the kit anyway because of what we do mm -hmm. for jobs. Um, and just be available and set up a network to do that. But as it obviously got bigger in terms of like interest and stuff like that, we ended up doing uh, threat intelligence. We did some advisory work. Um, I'm mean, going to like asking, trying to volunteer cybersecurity services in a actionable, meaningful, useful way. It's incredibly difficult. Um. So, like, uh, it's difficult when people, I'd have hundreds of people message me mm -hmm. asking if they can help, but they don't know what to do and what they, and even to the point they're like, I'm not even sure what I can do. And it, so it's really difficult from a logistics point of view alone. Yeah. Um, so what we try to do is, like, we try to do stuff that gave out advice. We try to encourage my message to people is generally, like, you don't need permission to, to volunteer. Go out to your doctors and GP surgeries. Go and speak like your trusts and set etc um but also we ended up doing so lots of like um i did some vulnerability analysis at scale mm -hmm. trying to look at how uh where, where their weaknesses and then working out how we can try and solve those problems so that we had different different people working on different bits um my stuff was very much less talking to people i thought i thought it was something that you know when when, when i saw you know then seeing the the intelligence sharing that was going between people in order to be very proactive and, you know, rather than waiting for things to happen about sharing what they were seeing elsewhere and hoping that other hospitals and other practices would be able to take those and, and put, you know, put controls or put mitigation in place before it spread. Because you know, WannaCry was very reactive. Everyone was kind of rushing. But for me, it was, you know, this was, it was what we should be doing <laughs> um, as a community, as, you know, sharing intelligence and sharing knowledge and sharing experiences so i felt that if something that, that this was for realization when i saw the cb19 and i saw the amount of information what people were contributing i think the intelligence piece for me was was really impressive because it's what we should be doing as an industry we should be more open and, and not afraid um sometimes I, I get worried like security researchers like ourselves when we share stuff all of a sudden you know you, you sometimes get, you know, maybe, you know, people look at it from a criminal perspective. You were working on some type of exploit and now all of a sudden, you know, organizations or, you know, um, law enforcement. I think that we should not be afraid um, and the law should protect the, those. It, it all comes down to the motives. It all comes down to what your intentions are. Um, are. Are your intentions to protect the system by sharing information or is it, are you looking, you know, alternative motives for for financial base or for, you know, um, so it gets into one of the things that I want to get. So from your experiences with that, which I think is impressive and is, is fantastic to see, um, who is who is the real adversaries? Who 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 was it? Who 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 was really attacking us? <laughs> is it? I mean, should I be worried about um, you know somebody hacking into you know my my home and stealing laptops? Or should I be worried about somebody getting into my phone or losing devices? Or should I be worried about going to take a, a going for a pee break when I'm on a train and not having to pack everything up and bring it into the, the toilet with me? Um, I mean, am I should I be worried about the you know the Russians and Chinese or you know hovering satellites and following me everywhere I go? Who? Yeah. Who is the real adversary? So, you know, what what is the threat out there? What's what what's the most likely thing that will happen? What's what's the least likely thing? Okay, so the first caveat on all of that, like, it depends who you are, <laughs> where you are, what you're doing. There's a, there, there are a lot of variables. So, for the purpose of answering this, I am talking about the average everyday citizen. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about someone who works for defence, who works in a, a VIP role or a high net worth individual. All of that stuff. That's not the majority, so I'm just going to caveat that. Because yeah, every you know, day working citizen, who's you know, yeah, somebody who's, like, who's, you know, who's like, working at a supermarket, or who's you know driving a bus, or a yeah. taxi driver, the hairdresser, someone, what, someone who's not of particular interest uh, in terms <laughs> of like they haven't got state secrets or any yeah. weird security research sitting in their pockets that they don't want someone to take. Um, I, I think that like the biggest threat I would say to um, I'll use myself as an example of this, right? My biggest uh, threat's me. Like, I am definitely going to be losing something way, way, way before someone's going to be coming up and, and probably stealing something from me. Um, 
I mean, it's really odd, isn't it? So, like, I did some stuff, and it's online, so this isn't like it's news to the world. Like, I'm open with the research I do and with the, the the fun conversations I have. I sat there looking at it, and I was like, okay, like, if I'm a normal person, which I am, so like, I might be a little bit more beefed up on the security front, but I'm, you know, that kind of makes not too many odds in the sense of what I've been. Yeah, we're a little bit more, you know, let's say, you know, conscious about <laughs> about things, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, Everyone is than the get, average person. If you can pwn my mail, I'm not asking anyone to try, by the way, unless you're a friend, DM me, that's okay. <laughs> like, um, if you can, I'm, I've got an Office 365 E5 license, hmm. right? I've got MFA, I've got conditional access, um, I've got everything logged, I've got like a decent security score. Like, that stuff is hard to get into. Not impossible, but if you're hmm. remote and you're trying to pwn my mailbox, you're probably not going to, right? That's, yeah. Uh, that's probably where it is from a hardening, at least I hope so. Um, whereas the average citizen doesn't have that, right? Like the, so you're going to get fished, right? That's like, I think it's like almost guaranteed if you operate on the Every internet. day, every right. day. I mean, I mean <laughs> I've got all my alias emails set up and they're just nonstop. The moment, the moment you subscribe to one thing, it's only a matter of time before that gets on a, on a, on a opportunistic target list that they just basically, you know, bombard it with, you know, and some of it's legitimate marketing. Some of it's legitimate sales. They're just trying to get your information. They're trying to get you to do something. They're trying to get you to, a, a good deal. And then a very small amount of it, you know, does get into, you know, what is a phishing attempt. I think some of the some of the impressive ones that I've seen recently are the ones that look like, uh, you know, you get an email saying your account looks like it has suspicious activity. Did you log on from this location? I mean, they're getting pretty good. Uh, and for the average person looking at that, I, I don't think that they'd be able to tell the difference between the real uh, and and the fake one. I, I mean, I don't understand. Right, this is this I think is nuts. Our security messaging has been for many years. Don't click on dodgy links. <laughs> How would you know? Right, like obviously we get like um, we get some scammers who are terrible. They they don't do any real targeting. They don't use a native language person. They use sloppy tradecraft. It's crap, right? They like they're just throwing stuff out onto the wall. And they're probably still getting hits because that's life. Um, but like it's not that difficult. If, if you want to start upgrading your like phishing capability, what you do is you sign up as a legitimate customer, get yourself a password reset link or uh, you know, uh, try and hack your own bank account and get an alert, and then you copy it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it, I know big trade secrets I've just given away there. Well, that's, um, that's, I mean, that's that's the techniques is you want to get it to look as legitimate as possible by by having them, you know, by replicating the same experience you would get as signing up for something, you know, yeah, so I mean, that they will see all the same details. I mean, I know I obviously don't do this, so bear with the, the phrasing I'm using is just uh, like common language rather than me. <laughs> but like, if you're going to go and steal stuff, I'm like, cool, let's go and visit your brand. I'm going to email you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to steal all your footers. I'm going to steal your, yeah. your PowerPoints, your Word documents. I'm going to help. I mean, I, I would I would actually, if it was a, a local area, I would, you know, I would go somewhere if I needed to. But like, mm -hmm. you can digitally online, like just try and yoink as many assets as possible. Yeah. And then you're going to craft your craft your wares. I got told off by um, Rick for saying craft, so I don't know what to say. It's like a beer, isn't it? um, <laughs> so you're going to put together this stuff, and I think that the the messaging around like being able to spot stuff. I've got a, a view which, um, and again, language is odd because people read it in different ways or hear it in different ways. I don't really care what people click on, right? Personally. Because I'm sitting in a world where if I've designed and built a computer platform that everything goes to shit if you click on a link, <laughs> I've failed, it's right? It's a very I'm bad design. I mean, the thing is, is that the internet and it was created to click on. The application we used to actually interface into that world, the browser, was made to click on. Um, we're all using our fingers and, and, and mouses or whatever it is to interact with that. And it's the click on things. It's the type in stuff and click on things. So to tell people to be careful about don't click on those things, but click on these things and how to tell the difference. Um, absolutely. I mean, that's we're at this, when we are depending on the people to make the best security decisions possible, we're, we're in a failure at that point. We're not going to be successful.
Yeah, and I'm, I, I, I think people, some people anyway, I think because we've brainwashed the world into hearing things like rotate passwords every 30 days, have eight characters with uppercase, lowercase, and all that crap, which doesn't work. Um, and we tell people, oh, don't do this, deploy MFA, because it's really easy. It's not easy to deploy MFA. I'm not saying don't, yeah. don't do it. <laughs> but I've gone, and, I've gone to taxi drivers while I'm in taxis, hmm. or I've gone to family members, and I can tell you this. They are not sitting there going, Dan, this is really fun. I really, really want to do this. They're like, Dan, I use the same password for my mobile. I've got no pin code on it. Um, I've got the same password for Facebook uh, and like all this stuff. Like, generally speaking, they want to do the thing, not protect the thing. Mm. They are not security consultants. They're not pen testers. Right. They're not thinking like they've got like uh, the NSA or the CIA or the, 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 grew or fsb and, after and they're not they're not too worried about having tiktok on their phone either <laughs> well, they don't care. like and every, like literally if, this is my experience of speaking to people i, I, I do that a lot that's uh, i think a useful skill in life most people say to me who are not in the in the spy games as it were like they're like dan i've not got any money dan i like I, you know like <laughs> What's someone going to do? They, they're probably not going to be able to do that much to me. Like, I haven't got millions of pounds in my account. Um, you know, like, okay, my Facebook bit gets hacked. I just create a new account. Like, I don't think the impact levels, they can, they can be wrong. Again, we're looking at a curve, aren't we? Yeah. I don't think the impact levels for some of this stuff to some people are at a point where the likelihood and impact means that they are going, you know, what I need to do every morning is I need to wake up and I need to make sure the reflection in my eyeball on my selfie doesn't show my location, which is stupid <laughs> shit that we do, right? Because we live in a constant state of paranoia and a constant state of um, uh, fear. And it is fear, right? right. Like, yeah. and, and especially if you're a security consultant and expert, you don't want anyone saying that you don't know what you're doing. You must be the most secure James Bond spy person in the it world. It must be per perfect yeah. perfection. That's and I think I think I I, I loved uh, John Hammond's recent one where he did a talk. Uh, I think it was the end of last year on imposter syndrome, and because we we, we there's, it's impossible for us to be perfect. It's impossible for us to know everything, and that's why we surround ourselves with people who know things that you know, that they specialize in um, and, and they, they have to go to, you know, where we can actually go to them and ask for questions. Um, so I think it's always about, you know, we shouldn't be trying to set up that uh, in, to be in info security that you have to be perfect. You have to know everything because it's not possible. And there's going to be things that I don't, there's, I write things down because I can't remember everything. Um, and I had to go to my notes in order to, to remember certain commands or certain practice. Exactly. I mean, I, I can't remember half the passwords. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I've, I've, got, I've got digital password managers. I've got offline ones. I've yeah. got cloud services. I've got books. I love the mm. books. The books, I'm, I'm not kidding, right? My books, the stuff that, it's the stuff I care about that really I don't want getting burned. Yeah, because I think it's important. Let's, let's talk about that, that context, uh, context part of it because, you know, there's one thing is, you know, we see a lot of people online and social, you know, saying, oh, my goodness, you know, mm -hmm. taking pictures of password books in the shop. It all comes down to the context is what are you putting into it? Where are you storing it? I think the, the difference is, is because I think we're thinking about, you know, 10, 15 years ago when people, yes, used to put sticky notes on their monitor and write their passwords down or used to keep it on the keyboard. They still do. That's what, yeah. <laughs> and, that's what, and they still do. They, they still do. <laughs> but there's a difference between somebody putting a sticky note um, or having a password book sitting on their desk to somebody who's sitting at home. The average person who's, who's you know, it's, it's to protect their personal stuff and they're keeping it in the drawer in their home. I mean, how many people are going to get access to their home and be able to get into that drawer? Um, what's the likeliness of somebody you know, going and stealing your password book? No, I mean, I'll be honest. If you can get here, you've got to get through me, right? And I'm not, uh, I'm not <laughs> huge, but like, um, good luck. And like, uh, the, the the probability of someone getting here, I mean, Joe, what are you going to steal? Are you going to steal my password book? Are you going to steal my watch? Are you going to steal my watch? <laughs> Right, I think the, a, Johnson, your your car would probably be a bigger target. Yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> it's just really odd in terms of. It's I find, and I've struggled this week in, in a nice way. I've had such a blast. 
I've obviously been uh, having fun and engaging the community and, and creating content and uh, around this subject. And it's not particularly about the, the thing. The thing was just a catalyst and a, an excuse to I- explore. Yeah. The thing is around looking at risk and looking at probability and looking at threat. And like the, the easy thing everyone can say is, oh, your threat model isn't my threat model. Well, but it is largely, right? Like I'm just a, a normal dude. Okay, I work in the industry and do some stuff so you could say it's slightly different. But I've largely got the same threats, right? I'm largely like, oh, to be honest, I don't generally get phishing emails, right? I don't know why. It's a bit like some of my honeypots. I think people just... <laughs> see Dan and they're like, shit, I'm not going after him. <laughs> He's going to start tweeting about me uh, and making jokes. I think that's the, it's not that I'm going to cyber them. It's just, they're worried that I'm going to uh, start taking the piss out of them on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's, um, I think we largely do have the same sort of the views, right? Mm. Like some of my customers do not have that. Some of them are like, that's a different story. But for me, I'm like, okay, well, what do I need to care about? What's the context? What's the likelihood um, of this happening? And what's the impact if it does happen? And then you end up in this really strange space. So like uh, the list, that I, I, bear with me, I won't be able to remember it now, but the list was like uh, threat actors phishing, financial frauds, and trying to, the marketing emails, I actually consider them to be threat actors. Um, <laughs> they're trying to get your information. <laughs> if you copy the marketing tech fishers, here's a tip from from me: if you copy marketing teams, you will get a better click through and a better credential rate. Yeah. But the, um, I think when you look through, it's like uh, the probability of stuff happening is like software bug. And I don't mean vulnerability; I mean it's failure, right? Failure of something, loss of something. I cannot tell you, uh, and I'm not a complete klutz, but like, um. I lose stuff sometimes. I lose stuff in my office. I can't find stuff. I've got air tags on all my kit and stuff that's important. So I can find it when it's two seconds away from me. I look in the fridge and I can't see the thing in front of me. You know, it's like, maybe that's just because of uh, like a, a, a dude thing. But like, um, so I think like we've got this like hierarchy of uh, risk scenarios and threats that, that we need to protect against. And then when you start looking at the stats, my stats mm-hmm. might be wrong. I'm not God. Um, but I start going into the likelihood of this stuff. And I'm sitting there going like, okay, so what's the likelihood that I lose something? Uh, I would say very low, but more than someone's going to steal it. I, I cannot remember the last time I'm touching, touching, uh, well, not wood, but the uh, touch wood. Um I can't remember the last time someone stole something from me, especially physically, right? And that doesn't mean it can't happen. It doesn't mean it won't happen. But, like, I've got nice watches. I've got cool phones. I've got gadgets everywhere. I've not had someone steal anything from me physically ever uh, since uh, I got mugged when I, at knife point when I was a kid. Um, and I think that's the last time someone – and even then I did try and take – like, I, that wasn't a – here you go. I, I think I was quite um, – I was quite resistant given that I shouldn't have been a troll. I should have just said, here you go, mate. I didn't manage to not not get my stuff nicked. That's the last time. I think I must have been 17, 18 years old. Mm. Um, Tara's had a phone stolen out of her bag in London yeah. at once. So we've been together 12-ish years, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's, she's, she has, has had something stolen once. I had a bike nicked. But that's not really a cybery thing. <laughs> so I don't think I've ever had a laptop nicked. I've never knowingly, at least my memory doesn't recall, ever having a, a high-end phone nicked. I, I think um, it really also, you know, to that point, it comes to sometimes the community where you are. You know, if, you know, if you're in a, a city which has got a higher crime versus a city or are living in, you know, sometimes your proximity, you know, I remember, you know, I grew up in Belfast, so... Um, you, you never left your door open and you didn't, you know, you, you always parked your car nice next to a nicer car and then you wrapped chains <laughs> around your steering wheel. And, you know, those were the days where you used to take your radio to bed with you at night from the car. I, was just gonna say, the we, I used to do that as well. It's like take the head unit off and then you put it in your glove box because you didn't want to take it into the cinema. Or you'd take it into the cinema and the person you were with would look at you like you're a weirdo. You're like, what have you got? It's like, oh, it's my radio. Um, <laughs> The, the things that we used to do in order to kind of, you know, reduce the risk. Um, 
and it gets really kind of to where, you know, a lot of the things that the media and news, you know, what we see amplified out there is things like nation state attacks. And to be honest, I, yet most of them are stealthy. We don't hear about them. That's the thing is that they don't want to be detected. They, they want to stay hidden um, versus, you know, uh, us losing devices uh, to the point where I think the most, you know, for me, the, probably the most you know, is those opportunistic attacks where it's somebody who is in a criminal gang and they've decided to basically move from one criminal activity uh, into, you know, doing more digital online scams. And you get, you know, they're, they're looking to do, basically invoice fraud or try to get you to buy things uh, that don't exist that you'll never receive. Um, like crypto scams, right? That's got to be a high. A lot of, you know, exactly. Those, the, the biggest, I think the biggest scams <laughs> is the crypto scams. Those okay. are the ones that people are, you know, quick quick money uh, when it doesn't, there's no value that exists. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, and I'm, I've got to be careful what I say here because of the, 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 the world and someone, and someone who I've spoken to might hear me say this. People that want money quick, mm -hmm. they get scammed. They get scammed really easily. I, I get asked loads, and I'm, I'm not into cryptocurrency. I'm not into NFTs. I'm glad for everyone that is, whatever. But like, um, fill your boots. But the, it's people that want money quick, or it's people that want games for free, or, or films for free and stuff like that. Like, and don't get me wrong, I, 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 I pay for, I'm lucky I get to pay for my stuff. Um, I don't sit there downloading weird stuff. I do, but it's just that's like for actors and breaches and stuff like that. But like um, <laughs> the typical people, the stuff I see in like normal people's lives, it is it's them getting scammed. Oh, I won the lottery that you didn't pay for, or oh, I could buy this crypto and they're going to give me like a bazillion pounds back, or just really weird stuff that is largely financially driven. Where you've said to someone, "I'm going to make you money for basically not doing anything." And them going okay, and then, I mean that's that to me is the the issue for most people. I think when we look at like the, like obviously we can't ever have a hundred percent view, right? And I know that. Mm -hmm. right? I know that I know that I don't know everything. I know that my view is not perfect. Uh, I don't let perfection get in the way of me at least helping, and or at least you know I managed to protect myself roughly. Okay, so uh, and 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 some systems that were holding some sensitive stuff so that, that you know that we didn't get any anyone in there that we know of so that's good um so i try and take a pragmatic but a realistic and a scientific where you can view right and it's hard mm -hmm. but you know like if you're a nation state and you want to get in somewhere you could just get a job there or you could pay someone off to put a usb key and, in. and and that's what a lot of the espionage and, and, and you know agents have done over the years. That's they they went and, and and moved into countries and 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 spent years undercover getting into organizations. I mean, and this is the thing: who who are you, and what are you protecting against, and who are you protecting it against? And it's like, okay, so if you get you can look at some of this stuff online, right? Go and go and Google your hearts out, but go and look at like we talk about operational security in the industry, right? It's opsec, it's everything. No one talks about per second in our industry, which is weird because that's mainly what we're concerned <laughs> with. But anyway, um, and then you go and look at the, the threat actors that we know about, and I'm talking up to nation state level. Their OPSEC's terrible because they don't care. What they care about is speed and effect. They don't care about, oh, my God, I must be super spy. Um, <laughs> like, And how we think about how this stuff works is so different, I think, from a defender from an attacker point of view even when we think about our attacker stuff i worry like i don't, i was talking to some um it was part of the cyber up campaign but like i was talking to some mps or something uh and i was like i had to turn around to say to people can you please reform the laws in this country because i'm fairly sure that i break the law because i write software sometimes that is basically malware mm -hmm. Or I like you know you end up doing weird stuff with OSN yeah. and doing stuff in threat intelligence that that is and that's what, you, know, you know I know I know in the US they've been trying to get around changing the laws because the Q Computer uh, Abuse Act um, has they trying to change it but it comes down to it's you, you have to prove your motive <laughs> it's it's you're, yeah. you're assumed that <laughs> until you prove that your motive had all other, other intentions. Um, so it, it is improving me. I think you know they are starting to look at these laws because ultimately, 
Um, anyway, hacking yourself, we, we always say it's, you know, it's not a crime. It's, 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 a, it's a way of life. It's a, it's a, it's a mind state. It's, it's about curiosity. And we want to make sure that, you know, by default, those, you know, minded people are not basically, you know, being criminalized because ultimately their motive is actually good intentions. It's, it's all about helping. It's about making the world a safer place. It's about uh, using their skills uh, to identify weaknesses and then ultimately to, to, to resolve those, to, to mitigate them. Um, so I think definitely the laws definitely need to be um, a lot of some countries are moving that direction. Uh, some are a bit slower than others. Um, but it's it. I think the realization. I think when we get into where there's more collaboration between government officials and, and lawyers and organizations, law enforcement and researchers, when we have all of those communications together, we definitely can you know move much faster. I think for too long they were in silos. They were all you know shouting over over the wall at each other, hoping that the other would hear or or, or act, um, but. Um, we're getting to the point where that collaboration is much, much better. It, it's, it is happening, and the realization is there. Yeah, I mean, the intent for me is a huge thing. Mm. I think people, I'll be honest, I think this is a time thing. I think there's still a lot of people that think these computers are weird, scary magic things. Um, <laughs> and the people like myself and Joe and, and our friends and, mm. uh, and the community I don't think they understand it. I don't think they realise that there are so many, probably more people with good intentions than bad intentions. And Absolutely, the majority. I, I think I believe the majority of us is, is good intentions. I think it's a, this a, goes back to the same thing: yeah. the probabilities. The probability of mm -hmm. loss is massive. Well, the probability of like of something happening like to this laptop I'm on at the minute, right? Mm -hmm. The likely probability, I think, would say that nothing is going to happen to my laptop. Again, if we leave it on a train and unattended. I don't think something's going to happen, right? It's not saying it mm -hmm. won't happen. I'm just saying it's more probable it won't. And you go through and you go into this. If everyone is a criminal and there's such a high risk of everything and people aren't doing things for good intentions, the whole world would be on fire, more so than it is, right? <laughs> like, um, it, would, it, would be, it would be absolute chaos, wouldn't it? The, you know, the system Absolutely. wouldn't work. And so I think that there's this whole... I think people are scared... Or unsure about what the what digital looks like. I think we've got a, you know a time lag, um, and I do think though that people are starting to realise this stuff. You know, for all the stuff I say about okay, let's not let's not try and fud everyone to death, and let's try and communicate properly and in a way that's meaningful and that helps drive change and helps drive improvement. Um, you know, there is a serious side like, massively, which is. Uh, some of our like critical infrastructure, some of our you know our lives, the services our lives depend on are at risk from digital threats, right? That isn't me fudding it up. There are there are things that I won't say, but you can. It shouldn't be the way it is. We've deployed technology as a human race faster and cheaper, without making it safe. Yeah, it's it's been it's been about convenience versus you know. And I was, I was get kind of from my side. It's you get one of this convenience. Then the other thing is we talk about a lot of security by design, and I think you know that's a it's a great initiative. But we really need to get to where it's security by default. It's it's built into it. It's something that's already turned on. You have to you have to, and we have to make it zero friction. Where it's all about making it something that everybody can use. And I think you brought up an important point here is that that we sometimes we put it cyber all into this one massive category and we try to treat it all equally all the same um you know we try to make it look like all these nation state attacks and critical infrastructure and um the ransomware gangs and the everyday person who you know was getting fished and uh we all put it into this one big category and we're not really good at really separating it and, and having it properly defined into you know where, where it's applicable and and that's where the fear to your point is that when you know all of a sudden, we hear about the critical infrastructure and the media you know, bring it out. And then all of a sudden, you're getting called by you know, family members saying, should they be worried? <laughs> uh, I think that's the interpretation. I think, I think we're, we're, we're having a communication problem about yeah. really that def definition of what it is we're protecting. And that's why I thought it was always important today to talk about you know, who is the real adversary. And, and sometimes it is us. Sometimes it is a criminal gang who's doing that somewhere. Sometimes it is... Uh, somebody who's looking to to make quick money by by putting some type of digital scam, um, but we have to make sure that we have clearly defined that you know 
who 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 should be worried about different types of threats? Um, yeah. Who's it applicable to? And I think your point about communication. What, what is it? It's twenty twenty three, right? Hmm. We've like we're at risk. Like the way our technology is at the minute isn't that great. But like I fished myself this week using a new uh, new build laptop, and I used the technique that. Uh, I was amazed my PDF got through, but whatever, uh, cool. <laughs> uh, I didn't try. <laughs> I got blocked on my first attempt. My second one, I, I didn't. Um, and I went to do an SMB uh, hash capture. Mm. Uh, and because I was using Windows 11 and I was using a Microsoft mm. account, I, I didn't have an NTLM hash sent. So mm-hmm. like a technique that, that, that's good, that's valid, that works yeah. across like a lot of stuff. This is to get creds. And obviously it's relating to the latest CVE for the Outlook client, slightly different. Mm-hmm. But you can generally send someone a link. Uh, and as long as you put it in the right level of like nesting, um, yeah. you can get them to send their hashes. But technology is like they're changing the systems. Like uh, it's a bit like when SMB v1 was disabled out the box in Windows. There is a long tail on these protocols and changes, yeah, and you still you find that, a lot of them. You know, in, even internally, yeah. you know, they they they, they remove them from the from the internet facing kits and stuff. But internally, there's so much old systems. I, I you know, when you get if you did an inventory internally in the network, you're gonna find old dusty machines from the 2000s. That yeah, yeah. somebody's just having onto their desk that basically, you know, that was meant to be decommissioned, you know, 15 years ago. And they're still using it because some old application that doesn't support certain file formats um, that, you know, uh, or that doesn't, it isn't made anymore. So, and they've got loads of old, uh, you know, applications are on that machine and they're still using it. And, and, you know, it might be running really, really old software at all, you know, unpatched and no one knows about it. I can't even, I've seen even uh, companies with a lot of advertising companies who do like, you know, graphic designs and stuff. They've got some old machines sitting there just because the file formats or the versions, um, you know, old applications that have, have disappeared and they're still dependent on them. Um, and, you know, it's, there's no visibility that's going to change them anytime soon. So, right. Wait, you were saying about comms, right? And communication. And this is the kind of bit that I'm like, I, I am obviously playing this week with the world uh, in, a, in a jovial, good, hopefully encouraging debate and encouraging thought. Absolutely. But I think that what I'm, part of what I'm trying to say is if we have been telling people for 20 years to not leave their machines unlocked for 10 seconds while they go to the toilet or uh, <laughs> to not do these things with passwords and to, uh, you know, We've, if we keep telling them the same thing, I mean, I'm getting so bored of it. They must be going nuts. They, oh, they, they probably aren't. They probably are like this. We're not listening. You weird security people. You think that like Russia or China or you know uh, North Korea are going to come after me, but actually, I'm I'm Joe Smith from Hull, and all I want to do is go to the chippy and buy a bag of chips with my iPhone. Like, I think we've got a huge communication problem, and I might be wrong about that, but. The stuff we talk about is not new. It's not novel. Um, the risk landscape has changed hugely, right? The, the 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 level of technology we're deploying, it's everywhere. It's getting smaller. It's getting more integrated. Um, but I think we need to do better at communicating. I mean, if you look at some of the stuff, like we were talking about the, the Computer Misuse Act and stuff, the idea of breaking encryption is idiotic. Like the other one, the idea of you handle breach data, you're a criminal. That would be put, oh, putting me, yeah. probably I've, Joe. I've, I've, I've had, a, probably. I've had a, a few a few slaps in the hand for <laughs> in the past for that. <laughs> We're talking about destroying our industry hugely and the ability to defend and understand threats because someone has decided to say, oh, I think it's a good idea to make someone a criminal if they touch breach right. data. Um, we, we're failing at comms. We're failing at comms. Right. Policies aren't right. People, general people, and policymakers, I, we're, we're failing. We're doing better than we were, maybe. And I say maybe, mm. but we're not getting it right. And yeah. what we definitely really need to know our audience better. I think that's that's ultimately you know to start understanding really who it is, and uh, you know rather than just assuming, we have to get to the point where you know we have to be you know put ourselves in those situations and try to better understand. You know what it is we're trying to achieve. And I'd like to get. 
Yeah. Any any things? Any recommendations you would have? Anything that you would suggest? You know, what for people just to get started? What should be? You know, what should they be really? Where's a good place for them to go for information that would be applicable to them? Well, in the UK, go and visit the NCSC website because I think that that is the an impartial. It's got clear guidance. Mm. It's not vendor aligned. You've got the 10 steps to cyber. You've got guidance for every vertical from critical national infrastructure through to um, mm-hmm. through, through to personal and small business and third sector. So, like, I, I, and obviously it's from the UK. So, like, uh, go and speak, go and see the UK. Uh, so, <laughs> but the NCSC site, at least to me, is a really good, it's sensibly grounded space. I think the thing I would tell people is. The biggest risks I see are people using the same password and their passwords are terrible. Um, on, on many devices, yeah, and many yeah, accounts. And like, loads of people I know uh, don't have don't protect their phones. If you, if you get their phone, then you've got access. Um, I mean, this, this is... Telling everyone to set a complicated password to log into their phone. I mean, I, I would use biometrics, but not everyone's got a, a 1,500 quid phone or, or several of them sitting in their pockets. So it's putting in place controls to prevent against likely threats, right? The, the, the password reuse and the crap passwords is such a problem still. And that's a problem in enterprise and it's a problem for people. Um, for stuff like social media accounts and stuff like that, and it, turn on MFA you use like put barriers in place against the things that you really want to protect so think about what i mean uh, banking apps i'm going to actually do some some stuff on this uh, hopefully next week um mm-hmm. but like look at your your devices look at what you what could go wrong and then look at what's likely to go wrong and then start thinking about how they improve if they do little bits mm-hmm. they're going to be in a better place than if they uh if they try and do everything at once I think the problem with saying to everyone that everything's a massive threat and a risk is it just, can, again, it just could, yeah. oh well we can't defend against it. Just dilutes it, it dilutes, it dilutes the real threat, the the real risks. Yeah, but I also think people say I can't do it. They say, "Oh, that seventy-two billion pound company just got ransomware." So how am I going to be able to protect myself? How am I going to do it? When, yeah. <laughs> and I think that from... sophisticated and everyone's sophisticated attackers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I think it comes from this idea you have to be security perfect. And none of us are. No one knows everything. And it's like, what do you want to do? Uh, you know, what's going to happen to you? Um, what's likely? What are your, sur- your context and surroundings do play a huge amount of it, as you said before. So I think people should just be more mindful around what what they what they've got, what, what they need to defend against. Um, I think it's important that as security practitioners that we help people in an organic fashion as well as, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. a grand marketing fashion as well. Because, like I said, I do this quite a lot because if I'm in a taxi and they ask me what I do, I either say I'm an accountant (laughs) or um, because of the meme, right? um, But if I tell them what I actually do, I I get weird responses, which are, can you break into a uh, a bank for me? I get asked (laughs) in time. They don't mean this. That, but it's just the thing because they watch basically Hollywood has brainwashed a lot of us, including you know, including me. Um, but I think people need to sit there, and I'm like, well, what, what, what do they actually have? What's the easiest? What, what's the easiest way a threat actor would take them out? And the first thing is it's online, it's phishing, it's credential theft, it's social engineering, it's scamming, and then you've got to work your way down through that chain. Um, if you go and follow, like, I've got blogs I've written with big long lists of hardening. Uh, steps i cannot ask my mum to go and look at the the windows 10 hardening guide or the uh, the iphone hardening guide this is not going to happen she's going to be like that's that's complicated so it's about doing things that you can you know don't reuse passwords if you need to use a password book right no. cool yeah, just, you just make sure you, you're you're aware where you're putting it that's that's yeah. the simple thing is just don't leave it in uh, public if you use a password manager, make sure you can recover it. I can tell you this, mm. not from bitter experience, but from obviously doing some research. Right. Like being able to recover from dev- events like a lost phone. I'm not mm-hmm. lost phones must be right. Like, if I'm That's wrong, the pain. losing your phone's really easy. And then you've got to think: if you lose it, what's going to happen to it? 
The mm. worst case is someone gains access to your device and then gains access to all of your data, all of your contacts, all of your um, records, your stored mm. credentials. Like that is a big problem if that happens. But yep. you need to put the, you need to look at where you are today before you start going. I need to, um, you know, have a, a dedicated uh, physical security team follow you around and, and uh, you know, have a, a consulting services team do regular uh, yeah. vulnerability assessments on your person. And yeah, you need to take the right approach to it. So yeah. small steps, uh, stop reusing passwords, don't use crap ones, use passphrases. Again, bolt on MFA where you can. Uh, and even if it, look, this is going to get me some grief, but if it means using a, a text message, at least in the UK, SIM swapping in the UK is not, to my knowledge, a huge right. risk unless you are holding a lot of uh, cryptocurrency. Every little step, even though they're not perfect, makes a difference. It just yeah. means you're a little bit more costly to the attacker to, to be successful. And, yeah. and uh, ultimately, the, the attacker doesn't want to to have high costs. <laughs> they're, they're operating a business in many cases, so they want to they want to have a good a, a good return on investment. I, I don't know. Apart from apart from like uh, people that are motivated for lulls, or people that are motivated for revenge, etc., um, or just maliciousness. Almost all of this stuff is they want to make money. That's why you know, that's why I was like, "What are you going to steal from me, Joe?" Like, would you grab my phone? Well, you probably would grab my phone as well. But like, are you going to take my watch? Are you going to take my phone? You're going to take my watch, right? It's, it's, ultimately, it's, it's ultimately, it's it's for most criminals, it's monetary, financially focused motives, and they're going to be looking, you know, at the most valuable thing. Um, and uh, typically, you know, it, if it, and it's quick, it's quick as well. Um, so we're we're going to do it the quickest and the least amount of effort. That's what they go after. Well, I could, it's like now, right? I'm not saying literally now, but let's say I could launch a cyber attack against like many to many, many to whatever the range is I want to try and, but probably thousands, if not more. You could probably start attacking stuff, right? With certain skills and, and prep and motivation. But you can fish people forever. Every day you can fish. Right, you can the just skill. keep fishing. It's the skill of things. Fish. Yeah, the skill, the skill that, you know, of, of doing it digitally is so much more effective than doing it a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah, I mean, like, A, I mean, this is the bit I just kind of, again, I might just be a weirdo, so, like, I'm happy to be wrong. If I'm going to go and and want to make money, I could do it drinking a Capri Sun from my from my living room, or in my case, my office, but, like, or as I am at the minute in the kitchen. Um, the kitchen's loving it this week. <laughs> and um, I could do that, and I can attack hundreds thousands of people if i go physically somewhere to do something i need to Cost. spend money i need to spend time i increase the risk of me getting caught massively and then i've got to go and go through all this exercise of chancing something and it actually pulling it off i mean the, the probabilities it's so I'm much lower. Speaking, it's, I'm, yeah. I've been passed some contact details for an insurance company, right? And if mm. anyone wants to help me, please feel to get in contact. Like, <laughs> I want to, I want to, there must be science that's better than my math because mm. my math is rubbish. But like, there's got to be science that says, here's the probability that, of this event occurring. Because the insurance the claims, yeah. it. They, they have the claims data and, you know, it'd be great to be able to, to have a little bit more transparency into you know where, where the payouts are happening and why why are they happening, and I ultimately to your point you know one of the things is that uh, for anyone who wants to to you know, who's doing the criminal side they, they also want to do it from a country where they may not even consider it being a, a illegal you know doing it in a place where it's quite actually perfectly fine to do it so where do we see all the stuff come from right like um, we see it come from India Africa South America uh, Russia. Uh, and then China, and that's and then some stuff in Iran. Like it, literally, we do this in honeypots, right? This isn't again. This isn't anything to, like secret. Uh, I literally put maps out showing who's at, what servers are attacking, and you can bounce traffic everywhere, right? So this, and you can use VPNs, but that isn't what we see. The data doesn't tell us that. We know we can do it. I do it. Joe does it. Like we sometimes will jump around, but large, and that's in targeted, purposeful stuff. When you, want, you want to you want to stay hidden. <laughs> That's yeah, the like if, we're trying to, if we're trying to move around and not be like, but if you're doing scams, 
Like we watch it all the time. Even when they do use VPNs, they mess it up and they forget. And then you've got the IP of theirs. It's it, the OPSEC and baddies for the mainstay doesn't exist. They don't care. They're in countries we can't get to. They're using connections yep. that we're never going to be able to do anything with. Um, so I just the, the, only, to... the only reason they do use some type of proxy or VPN is because the ones they're actually attacking from has been blocked. <laughs> that's the purpose. Yeah, yeah, well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> or or so, they're doing something where they, they want to be in the same yeah. country, like, area as you. So they've worked out where yeah, you they live. They want to like... be lo- yeah, appear local. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Dan, it's been fantastic chatting with you today. It's been, it's been way too long. We should not leave it this long again. Um, and many thanks for all of the insights. You know, it's for the audience. I think you know we really have a good insight and a good conversation on what what's the real adversary. Um, and I think it really comes down to who you know your context of your yourself is what you do, your social sphere around you, and what your motives and interests are. I think it really comes down to that's the definition. Of, and we as an industry had to get better at communicating. We had to get better knowing our audience better and, and not putting everything into one category, not making all attacks. Uh, be appear that they're applicable to everybody. Uh, we had to make sure that we we categorize them, we separate them where you know where they should be, and how you know who it impacts ultimately. So Dan has been had fantastic having you on the show. Um, if anyone's looking to contact you, I guess you know Twitter and, and social media is probably the easiest way to reach out. Yeah, and if you can find me, you can have a cup of tea. But uh, please don't try. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, but it's been fantastic ha- having you on, and many thanks. Um, so, for everyone out there, you know, Dan uh, Card, it's fantastic uh, having a chat, aka Mr. Reboot, um, or your alias. So, uh, definitely connect out. Uh, Dan's great, uh, great uh, thought leader, sharing information, sharing knowledge, and you'll definitely get a lot of value from from connecting with him. Um, so, again, this is a four on one access to podcast. Tune in every two weeks um, to get the latest episodes, the latest trends, and latest news about what you can do in order you know, to make the world, make the people around you just a little bit safer. So thank you, take care.